What do the most famous scientists have in common? A lot of them are eccentric, but what makes the scientists famous is the impact they have had on the world. Their discovery may have led to new technologies or completely changed the way we think about the universe. But what's most important is that they have had a large and lasting impact. And it is this word, impact, that I want to look at more deeply. When a scientist starts working on an experiment, they are taking ideas and results from previous work. They do this by reading scientific papers, and they acknowledge this taking of ideas when they write their own results in a paper. When a scientific article is published, it includes references to previous works that contributed to the author's current work. This is called a citation. And we can use this as a point system. The more times a paper gets cited, the more it has been used by other scientists, and the bigger the impact. And this can be very useful. If a scientist is applying for a job, they must advertise their impact by showing that they have many papers with lots of citations. In many ways, this is the most important metric for judging the quality of a scientist. However, citations are also used to market the journals that publish scientific papers. A private company called Thomson Reuters rates scientific papers according to the average number of citations. They do this by dividing the number of citations by the number of citable articles for the past two years. This is called the impact factor. The impact factor allows scientists to judge a journal and give a general idea of where they can publish their findings. If they deem their findings to be a big deal, then they'll submit to a high impact journal. If they do not, then they'll submit to a lower impact journal. High impact journals generally attract more attention, so their findings can spread more widely. This looks like a good system, but it is flawed. When a paper is first published, it is hard to guess what its impact will be, as it hasn't had time to get citations. So if we know that the impact factor of the journal is 10, then can we estimate that the number of citations it will receive in the next two years is about 10? No, there are two problems. The first is that citations have a skewed distribution. If we compare two journals, in Journal Red, most of the articles have less than 10 citations and the average is 5. Journal Blue has a higher impact, with many getting 10 and an average of 8. But then Red publishes one very high impact paper. It gets over 350 citations. This one paper bumps up the average to 12. If I see two new articles from these journals, I will assume that the Red paper will get more citations because it has a high impact factor when in fact the blue paper is more likely to do so. This is a big problem because one successful paper can ruin the whole system, and they often do. But there is another major issue. Although the calculation of impact factor looks very simple, it hides one major question. What is a citable article? Before, I said that impact factor is the number of citations divided by the number of citable articles. Simple. However, journals often publish many types of articles. Most of these are traditional research papers, but journals also include recent news, editorials, comments, and more. These different articles are in a grey zone. Are they considered citable? Well, we don't know. The criteria that make an article citable is kept secret, and appears to be at the discretion of Thomson Reuters. When Floss Medicine, a journal about medicine, tried to calculate their own impact factor before it was released, excluding or including different types of articles meant that their impact factor could have ranged from anywhere between less than 3, which is considered good, and 11, which is considered excellent. Since impact factor is supposed to be determined by the number of citations, there should be a strong correlation between impact factor and the number of citations a paper has received. But because of all these problems, when people analyze this relationship, they have found that impact factor is a very poor predictor of citations. So if it is not good at predicting average citations, then what is it good at predicting? It seems that it is particularly good at predicting retraction rate. When a paper is found to be wrong, either because of genuine error or actual fraud, the journal will formally retract the paper. And the strongest correlation for impact factor is with retraction rate. The higher the impact factor, the more likely a journal is to retract. This will be partly caused by the higher level of scrutiny these papers receive. However, the system surrounding impact factor can promote poor practices, and this leads to more retractions. One example where this is a particular problem is in China. Some government bodies give out funding awards when a paper is published, and the size of this award depends on the impact factor of the journal it is published in. A monetary award for impact factor will undoubtedly attract poorer practices to the top journals. And although peer review should pick these up, some will slip through the gaps. But much more widely than China, researchers who publish in top journals are often looked favorably upon during job or grant applications. One justification is that the candidate will have published recent papers, but it is likely that a competitor for the job or grant who published in a lesser journal could receive more citations over the next few years than the person who has published in a higher impact journal. Again, this career motivation attracts poor practices to the top journals. Now, retraction rate, even amongst the top journals, is low. But a reliance on impact factor for evaluating research is still widespread. There has long been a push to reform or remove impact factor in science, but as long as it continues in its current form, it will slow scientific progress.